story twenty two of abaft the funnel by rudyard kipling this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty two the adoration of the mage this is a slim thin little story but it serves to explain a great many things i picked it up in a four-wheeler in the company of an eminent novelist a pink-eyed young gentleman who lived on his income and a gentleman who knew more than he ought and i preserved it thinking it would serve to interest you it may be an old story but the g w k t h o whom for the sake of brevity we will call captain kidd declared that his best friend had heard it himself consequently i doubted its newness more than ever for when a man raises his voice and vows that the incident occurred opposite his own club window all the listening world know that they are about to hear what is vulgarly called a cracker this rule holds good in london as well as in lahore when we left the house of the highly distinguished politician who had been entertaining us we stepped into a london particular which has nothing whatever to do with the story but was interesting from the little fact that we could not see our hands before our faces the black brutal fog had turned each gas jet into a pin-prick of light visible only at six inches range there were no houses there were no pavements there were no points of the compass there were only the eminent novelist the young gentleman with the pink eyes captain kidd and myself holding each other's shoulders in the gloom of Tophet. then the eminent novelist delivered himself of an epigram let's go home said he let us try said captain kidd and incontinently fell down an area into somebody's kitchen-yard and disappeared into chaos when he had climbed out again we heard a something on wheels swearing even worse than captain kidd was all among the railings of a square so we shouted and presently a four-wheeler drove gracefully on to the pavement i'm trying to get home said the cabby but if you gents make it worth while though heaven knows how we ever shall guess orf a crown a piece might and um, anyhow i won't promise anywheres in particular the cabby kept his word nobly he did not find anywheres in particular but he found several places first he discovered a pavement curb and drove pressing his wheel against it till we came to a lamp-post and that we hit grievously then he came to what ought to have been a corner but was a bus and we embraced the thing amid terrific language then he sailed out into nothing at all blank fog and there he commended himself to heaven and his horse to the other place while the eminent novelist put his head out of the window and gave directions i begin to understand now why the eminent novelist's villains are so lifelike and his plots so obscure he has a marvellous breadth of speech but no ingenuity in directing the course of events we drove into the island of refuge near the brompton oratory just when he was telling the cabby to be sure and avoid the regent's park canal then we began to talk about the weather and mr gladstone if an englishman is unhappy he always talks about mr gladstone in terms of reproof the eminent novelist was a socialistic neoplastic unionistic demiglock radical of the extreme left and that is the latest novelty of the thing yet invented he withdrew his head to answer captain kidd's arguments which were forcible well you'll admit he's all sorts of a madman said captain kidd sweetly he's a saint said the eminent novelist and he moves in an atmosphere that you and those like you cannot breathe yes i always said it was a pretty thick fog now i know it's as thick as this one i say we're on the pavement again we shall be in a shop in a minute said captain kidd but i wanted to see the eminent novelist fight so i reintroduced mr gladstone while the cab crawled up a wall it's not exactly a wholesome atmosphere said captain kidd when the novelist had finished speaking that reminds me of a story perfectly true story 
In the old days, before he went off his chump, yeah, said the eminent novelist, wrapping himself in his inverness, went off his nut. He used to consort a good deal with his friends on his own side, visit em, you know, and deliver addresses out of their own bedroom windows, and steal their postcards, and generally be friendly. Well, one man he stayed with had a house, a country house, you know, and in the garden there was a path which was supposed to divide Kent and Surrey, or some counties. They led the old man forth for his walk, you know, and followed him in gangs to hear that the weather was fine, and, of course, his host pointed out the path. I dare say they had strewn rose-leaves on it, or spread it with homespun trousers. Anyhow, the old man took in the situation, and put one leg on one side of the path, and the other on the other, and with one of those wonderful flashes of humour that come to him when he chooses to frisk among his friends, he said, Now I am in Kent and in Surrey at the same time. Captain Kidd ceased speaking as the cab tried to force a way into the South Kensington Museum. Well, what's there in that? said the eminent novelist. Oh, nothing much. Let's see how it goes afterwards. Mrs. Gladstone, who was close behind him, turned round and whispered to the hostess in an ecstatic shriek, Oh, Mrs., whatever her name was, you will plant a tree there, won't you? "'By Jove!' said the young gentleman with the pink eyes. "'I don't believe it,' said the eminent novelist. I said nothing, but it seemed very likely. Captain Kidd laughed. "'Well, I don't consider that sort of atmosphere exactly wholesome, you know.' And when the cab had landed us in the drinking fountain in High Street, Kensington, and the horse fell down, and the cabby collected our half-crowns, and gave us his beery blessing, and I had to grope my way home on foot, it occurred to me that perhaps you might be interested in that anecdote. As I have said, it explains a great deal more than appears at first sight. End of story 22